Hello, spicy people of the internet. My name is Spice 8 Rack, aka a canonically queer planeswalker, and welcome to the War of the Spark flavor review. Modern Horizons has already been fully previewed at this point, and I'm rushing to get this out before M20 because Wizards simply does not respect my one video per cycle of the moon schedule. But don't worry, I'm sure I'll get around to making a video about those subjects by the time that Commander 2025 has come out. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down each planeswalker Walker in this set, comparing their mechanical representation with how they are presented in the War of the Spark novel, and if you haven't read that yet, I recommend you check out my audiobook speedrun on the subject. Also, in the spirit of Oathbreaker, a format that I've never played but I'm exceptionally excited to buy into as soon as my name is cleared of all crimes and my bank account is unfrozen, I'll also be reviewing the Planeswalker's signature spells and affiliated cards for flavour as well. Needless to say, this video will contain spoilers for the War of the Spark story, novel, art book, subreddit, comic series, and clothing line. Teo. Teo is a Gobakarnian. Yep, sure, we'll go with that. A Gobakarnian shield mage who spends the majority of the narrative of War of the Spark using his shield magic to block and battle Eternals. His presentation on cardboard is simple and perfectly apt, giving you hexproof and creating shield tokens in order to protect both you and himself. His light shield is also a fittingly flavorful card, being an illusion that can bolster an ally or even itself. Teo is shown throwing shield spheres at his foe in the novel, and so this shield's lack of defender and thus ability to attack isn't as much of a flavour fail as you might think. The only real element of the story that's missing in Teo's representation on cardboard is one of his most memorable moments in the story, when he defends against an attack by the god Eternal Kefnet, which doesn't translate into gameplay at all. Teo's shields can't block flying creatures and, even if they could, whilst Teo could only muster one gigantic shield during Kefnet's attack, you can actually produce two shield tokens with him before Teo is unable to produce any more. Is this an incredibly anal position to take on the minutia of the gameplay of War of the Spark? Yes. Am I an incredibly anal person? I'm not gonna answer that. Chandra. In the novel, Chandra is consistently berated by Jaya for not having more precise control over her powers, and so her card's title of Flame Artisan is a little bit rich, to be honest. With the rest of her card, her ability to exile spells with reckless abandon is pretty on point, and her passive ability, which retaliates against anyone who deals damage to her, is perfectly in sync with her character in this story. Chandra's Pyro Helix is actually shown in the novel, and Chandra's triumph is a great wee slice of story translated into gameplay. It sends Dobbin's Planeswalker card packing in the game, and is shown to send him off in the story as well. Overall, a pretty decent showing for flavour thus far, and this is the most interesting mechanical representation of Chandra we have seen in the game, and I am including the spoilers that I've seen for 2020, because, like, oh cool, we, we, we got emblems as a plus, as a plus ability. Oh, so you guys love emblems? Hey, quit. All the magic players who love emblems, go away! Teferi. I thought it would be a dang shame if Bolas got to kill Teferi again. I predicted he'd survive and I was right. Not that that says much, Bolas ends up killing barely anybody with a name. Rest in peace. Hissy Vyashinu man. Teferi is a secondary character in the grander narrative, and so we have a lot less to go on in terms of characterization to inform our analysis of his associated cards. That being said, his continual use of time magic is wonderfully represented in his ability to slow down your opponents with his passive and speed up his allies with his plus one. On the other hand, his negative three's ability to bounce permanent, his time twist, and his representation on time wipe are all never seen in the novel. I'm willing to accept that because we know he's capable of this kind of magic and nothing in the book directly contradicts this, I wouldn't consider this a flavour fail. It does, however, speak to a broader issue with a lack of cohesiveness and communication between the story team, art department, and Weissman himself. Ajani. We first see the Nyan Soul... Shaman? Soul Druid? 
We first see the Nyan Soul lumberjack talking about bird watching with Chandra's mum in her kitchen, and I have got to say that I love that Ajani has developed from a fierce warrior of inconsolable rage into a 60 year old man on the edge of retirement who just fucking loves gardening. How does his representation in the book compare with Ajani Greathearted? Well, he gains you life and puts loyalty counters on planeswalkers you control, which fits right in with his literal healing, like how he fixes Teo's head wound, and the more metaphorical healing he does with all the planeswalker rallying he does in the novel. This rallying is also represented in his ability to put plus on plus on counters on creatures and his passive Sarah's Blessing effect. His Pride Mate is an excellent choice for his signature spell as it evokes the meta-narrative of Planeswalkers being able to summon creatures from other worlds to battle, much as you, the Planeswalker, do in your standard decks. That being said, the Cat Warrior itself never pops up in the book and neither do the vast majority of any character's signature creatures. Ajani's cards are perfectly fine, but nothing that really lets the cat out of the bag. <laughs> I should have stuck with writing poetry. Jaya. Another planeswalker first seen in Pia Nalar's kitchen, Jaya takes up the role of Chandra's mentor throughout the narrative, instructing her protege to try to be more controlled and focused with her pyromancy. The difference between Chandra and Jaya's approach to their respective pyromancy is best shown in chapter 18, where Liliana remarks that the two pyromancers, Chandra and Jaya, have had little in common, the former with her massive eruptions of fire, charring two or three Eternals at once, the latter with her precision strikes of flame, taking out one at a time, but with more accuracy and at a faster rate. Yep, that was my Liliana voice. I hope, I hope you liked it. This is perfectly encapsulated when you compare Chandra's Pyra Helix with Jaya's Greeting. For the same price, one spell deals less damage in a wider radius, but the other deals more damage to a single target. And also, you can scry off of Jaya's one, which just makes it smarter. Jaya's Planeswalker card also reflects this character well when considered within the context of Chandra, with the latter's passive ability firing smaller pips of damage at a number of foes, and the former's enhancing individual fiery attacks. Now I still think it would have been right for Jaya to be killed during this set to up the pretty low stakes. If she got sliced in twain by the portal opening in the early chapters, it would have added real tension and anxiety to a story which was sorely lacking it. To make the obvious comparison, in Infinity War, yes, I will continue to compare these two things. Garrick is Cull Obsidian, you cannot change my mind. In Infinity War, two fan favourite characters bite the dust before the first scene is over, and in War of the Spark, the first quote unquote on screen death of a named character not only comes halfway through the novel in chapter 27, but it's. Uh, well, it's. it's Domri. I predicted Domri would survive War of the Spark, him turning on his Dragon Master once he realised that Bolas's plans for ultimate domination would affect his freedom. But I neglected one crucial piece of lore staring me right in the face that scuppered my prediction and that, of course, is that Domri is 16 years old and so is an idiot child idiot. He first turns up in the story leading a group of Grawl Havoc Wreckers throughout the city, saving Kaya, Teo and Rat from death in an alley before seeing the awesome power the eternal gods of Amonkhet can bring and switches to Bolas's side, which he had stopped being on before the book, apparently. Maybe? Uh, or maybe he just wasn't ever actually on Bolas's side at all, and Bolas just gave him all the power to defeat Borborygmos to destabilise yet another guild of Ravnica without... Him being a... It, it's really super unclear. Because of the lack of clarity as to what Domri's relationship with Bolas is, it seems that he's his anarch for a literal matter of seconds. Also, uh, this Bident thing doesn't ever exist in the book, and he never uses any Grull animals in the novel, so his ambush doesn't really have any basis in the story. And his name as well, like Domri Anarch of Bolas. Like, you can't be someone's anarch. That's not how anarchism works. That's, uh, like, inherently uh, at odds with that, um... You know what, actually, hang on. Oh, 
Hi, is that Dr. Paul Chasty, Professor of Russian and East European Politics at Oxford University? No, this is Vince, also known as President Kenobi, on the internet. How did you get my number? Oh, I, I, I must have dialed the wrong number. Um, you don't happen to have an understanding of contemporary anarchism, though, do you? Yeah, isn't that where you reject all outside oppressive forms of authority and instead you go on a voluntary cooperative basis uh, without fear of violent repercussions from said authority figures? Yeah, that, that, that's a, a pretty succinct way of putting it. And so, uh, in Board the Spark, when Domri actually sides with Bolas... Domri I, working for Bolas speaks more of him being a reactionary, rebellious, opportunistic character, more so than anti-authoritarian. I mean, it might be rebelling against his youth, of power structures in his past, but it's not truly anarchic. It's not an anarchist. Any anti-authoritarian stance will obviously perceive uh, Bolas to be, well, the, the true authoritarian. Look at his oppressive treatment of the citizens of Ravnica. His literal... I'm sure some anarcho-monarchists wouldn't have too much of an issue with the way he is, but on top of all that, if you think about it, he has an entire mind-controlled army of murder zombies. I mean, they are in servitude. They are indebted after death. If that's not an authoritarian stance, or authoritarian figure, I don't know what it is. <gasps> Jace Bellerin. Bella Bellerin? Jace... Jace... Ja Jackie B. None of Jace, wielder of mysteries, mechanics pair with Jace's almost exclusive use of illusions and invisibility throughout the story of War of the Spark. The only time he ever attempts to wipe someone's mind or use his mind magic aggressively is when he fails to do that with Liliana. He does use telepathy to communicate to his crew, and you could argue that his plus one drawing you a card represents a gain of information as a result of psychic communication, but the milling has nothing to do with his character in this story, and I don't even know what his passive and ultimate are supposed to represent. Whilst Spark Double does represent the illusionary side of Jace, I honestly think that Jace Arcane Strategist is a much more accurate representation of Jace in this story. The more information he gets, the stronger your forces, and his unblockable ultimate represents the mass invisibility that he uses to cloak the Gatewatch in during the start of the book. As for cards that are actually in the set, Jace's triumph as well has very little business to do with the story. At no point does Jace work out Bolas's master plan or why ultimate power is self-defeating, whatever that means. He was pretty much relying on Gideon just like everybody else and when that failed, he described it as the shattering of the hopes of every living soul on Ravnica. Doesn't really sound like you had a plan B there, Jace! If Jace did have a triumph, the closest he came was probably his decision at the end of the novel, but that has nothing to do with the ability or the art showcased on this card. Khan! Someone has definitely already done that joke before, haven't they? Khan doesn't do a whole lot in the start of the book, apart from delivering some absolutely cutting pedantry. You said she was a ghost assassin. I meant she's an assassin who specializes in killing ghosts. She's not a ghost who's also an assassin. She's alive. Khan frowned. Then ghost assassin is a very imprecise term. Bazinga. His Planeswalker card is a pretty standard Khan card, even though at no point in the novel does Khan stop any kind of artifact from working, and he also doesn't transform another artifact into any kind of construct. We have seen him do this kind of stuff in the story before, so I'm willing to let it slide. His minus two, however, is very flavorful and apt for this specific story indeed. Getting an artifact from outside the game and putting it into your hand is pretty spot on for how Khan transforms sports Hazaret Spear from a different plane into Ravnica. We never get to see Khan's bastion and he never creates any structure out of metal and spends most of the novel either literally just punching things or setting them on fire with Hazaret's Spear. Overall a pretty strong S for silver but not S for the like the tier list because it this is kind of like a, a C but C doesn't really go into it's more co Next planeswalker Ashio. I predicted that Ashiok wouldn't appear in War of the Spark, and it was with a heavy heart that I accepted I was wrong when their card was spoiled, but I was excited to see them in action in the novel. Then, I was stunned to find out that I'd actually been right all along! 
Ashiok doesn't appear bloody anywhere in the War of the Spark novel. That's right, not in the foreground, not the background, not in a dream sequence which would have been super fitting, or a flashback, or training montage, nowhere. Dak Faden references them once in the final assault on Bolas' citadel, but that's literally it. I have no way of determining if Ashiok's card is at all flavourful, because I have no character to base it off of, unless they're in one of the prequel novels that I occasionally get emailed to me, and just a quick note on that, I I really don't want to have to read a novel in my email. Who decided that was a good idea? Hey, at least Ashiok gets a reference. Try searching for a single instance of Kasmina in the whole War of the Spark novel. Uh, to be fair, Kasmina does get a small cameo in the War of the Spark booster chapters. Um, the first one, uh, they're all told from Rat's perspective. Uh, and they're mostly just like copy and paste of the chapters that Rat was present in, but you occasionally get bits of her monologue which don't give you any kind of additional like insight into any of the characters. Uh, we do get to finally meet Hekara, which is nice to know who this character is after the book where they died and came back to life came out. So there's... the the. Listen, like there's th this is a this is a long video. Ral Zerek. He's absolutely lovely and very gay. Liliana Vess. Liliana is a mess in this story. I'm of course going to talk about Raul Zerek, but it literally took me two days to decide on my introduction to him in this script, and I ended up landing on either that or this homosexual is homoelectrical. Don't you dare say I ever give you guys quality content. Wait, no, I was supposed to write that as like a negative. It was supposed to be a double negative. Oh, I played myself, no! Rao's outburst is a pretty standard representation of all the eternal blasting that he does in the novel, but Bolt's Bend is a slightly more specific representation of a key story moment. The one where he redirects the energy of the beacon out at Kefnet, although it is unclear as to why this card has Ferocious. Maybe it's because you need to be pretty powerful to survive all that energy. Can you, can you hear, can you hear that I'm actually getting further away from the microphone because I'm having to reach so hard? His Planeswalker card may seem quite bland on the surface, but does contain some subtle representations of key story moments. His negative two, for example, clearly echoes his beacon redirection, and his passive evokes the feeling of him absorbing energy and using that to charge his lightning bursts. But his plus two represents the ability granted to him at the start of the book to see past what most people can and detect planeswalkers, represented by the fact that you can look at the top of your library with scry. Again, maybe I'm really reaching, but I didn't graduate with two degrees in overanalyzing writing to let a good ambiguous metaphor go unspoilt with scrutiny. Liliana Mess. <laughs> See, I can steal jokes from Loading Ready Run and my YouTube community page. How does Liliana's character in her story pair with her representation on the cards? Well, I don't like a lot of them, to be honest. Many of the mechanics are either just off true flavor or straight up completely disconnected. Let's break it down. On her card itself, she does summon zombies, that's a plus, and at one point she devours the life essence of two eternal to heal herself up after the failed assassination attempt against her, but she isn't shown to gain any benefit or power as the drones of her dread horde are killed by the Gatewatch, so her passive doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If it had been a grave pack style effect where whenever a creature you control died, each opponent sacrificed a creature or a planeswalker, that would have represented both the dread horde's vicious slaughter of Ravdican citizens and planeswalkers as well as the Dreadhorde soldiers themselves needing to die in order to kill Planeswalkers. Her ultimate also doesn't make a whole lot of sense, although it could be representative of how she strips Bolas of almost everything he possesses at the climax of the narrative. Her triumph as well seems oddly placed as it supposedly showcases the moment when she defies Bolas and takes control of the two remaining God Eternals, Bontu and Aketra, but this doesn't match up with its Edict style effect. 
Maybe the fact that your opponents have to sacrifice one of their creatures is a reference to how Bolas manages to kill one of the two God Eternals before they despark him, but I've got no idea what discarding a card has to do with that or anything else to be honest. Also, Price of Betrayal, which showcases the moment of Liliana's near death, only removes five counters from her, one less than her starting loyalty. While she does survive her betrayal, I feel like this card should kill her without outside aid, otherwise it mechanically tells us that Liliana would have been busted but ultimately alive after her betrayal. Command the Dreadhorde is a fine reference to Rise of the Dark Realms and the damage it deals to you is a great mechanical representation of the pain that comes with wielding the Chain Veil, but I don't like how you can bring back Planeswalkers from a lore perspective, as such a resurrection never happens in this story. Finally, and maybe my biggest issue actually, is that in Finale of Eternity, Liliana is pretty clearly destroying the Chain Veil in front of Bolas, and well that, that just doesn't happen in the book. At all. Not even like a nod to it, she's still very much got it. That seems like a pretty vital detail that should have been included. If it's canon, that is a huge oversight on Weissman's part and changes every story connected to Liliana from here on out. And if it's not canon, then are we just supposed to forget that this card exists? Despite all of this, whilst I was pretty sure Liliana would survive War of the Spark, I am very pleasantly surprised with how happy I am that she did survive. It didn't feel cheap or like she didn't lose anything, although I really wish her previous character development had shone through a lot more in this story, and that we will see her grow again in future sets. Gideon. Gids. Meat Slab. Prince Harming. The Mediterranean Muscle. Gilderoy Punch Her! If you've been paying even the slightest bit of attention to War of the Spark, you already know that Gideon Jorah is dead, so I'll quickly recap what he got up to until that moment. Spoiler alert, it's mostly fighting. He uses the Black Blade to dismember a bunch of Eternals before teaming up with Ijani and jumping on a Pegasus gifted to him by Aurelia. Not Feather, who actually had a card in this set, just Aurelia. Also, his Pegasus is called Gideon's Promise and gets killed whilst trying to save the world because Greg Weissman wrote this entire book with his laptop balanced on his nose. In fact, let's do a quick lightning round of all the characters from Guilds of Ravnica blog who didn't make it into this book. There's Ashi Yokum Fibble Fib, Roller Eskenetera, Elhog Masa Kogo Krenko Tosamir and Zengana, Nikia Judith Kasmina Tejik and Haunt of Hightower, and also practically Nasa Tami Yo and Kiora. Oh, nailed it first time. <laughs> the card Gideon Blackblade is a phenomenal representation of not only Gideon's abilities in his story, but also of his continued hubris. On the surface, his minus six seems destined to kill Bolas, but when you first play Gideon, he can't. He's two loyalty counters off. Failing to do that, what's left for Gideon? Simple, to give another creature indestructible. Unfortunately, Gideon's sacrifice straight up doesn't work with Price of Betrayal. The act that Gideon is supposedly making his sacrifice for, which is annoying because Price of Betrayal does kill Gideon even if you plus one him. For Gideon's sacrifice to be 100% flavorful, it should have read, Choose a creature or planeswalker you control. All damage that would be dealt this turn to you and permanents you control is dealt to the chosen permanent instead. If counters would be removed from you or permanents you control this turn, remove that many counters from the chosen permanent instead. See wizards? See how efficient and not at all unwieldy this card is? I'm a game designer! God! As for Gideon's triumph, well, it's not interesting. It certainly captures a snapshot of Gideon at his most warrior-esque, and on top of all of that, I will say I felt an opportunity was missed in not making Gideon's Promise a legendary creature card at Uncommon like Mowu was. Promise was more present in the story than a large number of Planeswalker characters, and it would have been nice to throw a bone to the dozens of horse, unicorn, and pegasus EDH players around the world. I see you out there. Keep shining, you beautiful idiots. Dak Faden. Wasn't on a card. So... So there we go. I guess guess we move on. It would, it would have been nice to have one standard legal Dak Faden. Just one. 
at the moment, all we had was like, he was in the background of Bread to Hunt and in the flavor text of Artificer's Hex. <sighs> oh well. At least we've now got like 48 different versions of Chandra. Sweet! Kaya. Her cards don't showcase any of the diplomatic angle to her narrative throughout the book, but certainly does echo her ability to dodge death and slip through the seemingly impenetrable defences of the Eternals, although very few people ever had any trouble killing Eternals in this book. Her oath echoes a lot of her previously explored design space, and it's a tad boring, although I do like how your opponent's losing life for attacking is symbolic for Kaya herself dodging through their creatures unscathed to, as she puts it, ensure that everybody gets what they deserve. Vraska. We first see Vraska in the pirate city of High and Dry on the plain of Ixalan, resisting the call back to Ravnica, proving that Rao's beacon is less of a compulsory summons and more like one of those your computer needs urgent restarting and updating that you have to try your hardest not to accidentally click on. Other planeswalkers who resisted, ignored, or otherwise were unable to take up the call include... Oh fine, let's do another song. The Kimrits, I'm in Natu, Estrid, Elspeth, Coffin, Duretti, and Gara, Coogan, and Sarkin, and plus a bunch of yet to meet. How does her story match up with her cards? Well, whilst there's never an explicit moment when Vraska is shown to command a force of Golgari assassins, the implication of this lies in the many Golgari combatants that we see in the final battle, so I buy both her assassin spawning ability and her finisher card. I predicted that Vraska would die in the war as a girlfriend in the fridge moment for Jace, but I'm thankful that wizards didn't go down this route. Female and queer characters have a history of getting killed off as easy motivation for their boyfriend's story, and as bad Bad as I feel for whatever poor writer has to pick up Vraska's character arc after this mess, I'm glad she got a happy ending. Although I'm not sure why they sent the Gorgon Planeswalker to go and assassinate the one character who got blinded in War of the Spark, that seems like a slightly flawed plan. Consumerism. Wait, I don't remember this Planeswalker. At this point we've covered all the narrators of the book, except the two dragons, so let's take a break to talk about some of the planeswalkers who fulfil minor roles within the narrative. You may have noticed that I said that Narset, Tamiyo and Kiora were barely in the story. The Moonfolk and Merfolk are in the narrative but are never shown doing anything in any specific fashion, with Kiora being pretty blandly described as quote unquote fighting alongside Kaya. Narset has even less to do, despite being shown accessing Bolas's meditation realm in her artwork, she never actually goes there. None of these guys get any kind of action moment or even speech. Same with Tybalt, who gets one mention in the entire novel as fighting next to Davriel Kane. Davriel Kane? Dav- da Daddy Kane, oh, I cannot call him. As such, it's impossible to review any of these guys' cards within the context of the story. For God's sake, Moo gets more lines in this novel than any of the planeswalkers I just mentioned combined. I will take this moment to say two things though. Firstly, I love the planeswalker passives and how they will be used as a foundation for future character building as sets go on. With these, similar characters like Jaya and Chandra have clear and distinct differences and how they use very similar magic. I think this is my favourite faux mechanic of the whole set. The other thing that I'd like to quickly do is to properly thank a couple of my patrons for helping support my channel and this video, including Mama Pose, Matthew Lloyd, Vit Vittorio Grace, I really hope I got that right, and in response, I bolt myself. Thank you all, and thank you to the rest of my patrons, and thank you to all of you wonderful people listening to me now. Right, let's get back onto it. Woo! Davril Kane. Davril Kane. Daddy- No, I've already done this bit! The big DC actually has this really cool moment in the book where he saves Nyssa from getting de-sparked by grabbing the Eternal who's de-sparking her and absorbing the spell into himself, which somehow doesn't kill him. I don't really know Kane's powers, but something tells me that they don't extend necessarily to being able to take a magic bullet for Nyssa. His cards seem pretty focused on mind, stealth, memory, loss, pain, magic, and that really doesn't come across in the story. God, I really need to do the Ethics of Mill versus Discard video, don't I? Oh yeah, speaking of Nyssa, Nyssa! Nyssa takes a firm back seat after the God Eternals quote-unquote beat Vitu Ghazi, 
Way to sell the moment there. Offering advice for Chandra as to Dovin Barnes' powers, repairing the ley lines of the Guild Pact for Project Desperation, and channeling the manor from all ten Guild leaders slash representatives. Nissa's cards are pretty spot on flavour wise. Her triumph pretty much perfectly captures how Nissa pooled a vast amount of green mana to awaken Vitugazi, and that moment itself again is perfectly captured on the card of the same name. Vitugazi is a 9 9 elemental, which also means that if you treated Bontu and Rahonus as if they were working together or banding together to fight the elemental, then the pair of zombie gods do in fact kill Vitugazi and survive the battle themselves. Is, is that how banding works? I don't know. Tell me in the comments below. I will ignore you. Nissa's Planeswalker card has a real clean character. Her passive showcases her prowess with calling mana from the ley lines of the land. Her plus one symbolizes the awakening of Vitugazi once more. Her negative eight doesn't really have any link to a story element, but you could see it as her aligning the ley lines under the embassy of the guild pact, and the indestructibility could be a reference to Teo shielding the ley lines from Kefnet's fists. I say could, because I am reaching harder than a 12 year old underneath a shelf of delicious gel based washing detergent. Sorin and Nihiri. I bet you're asking yourself, right now, which one of these two ancient planeswalkers came out on top? How was their battle which was so well represented on the cards showcased in the book? Well, guess what? So am I! What you are currently seeing on screen is the entirety of the description of Sorin and Nahiri's battle and its aftermath. That's right, they work out their centuries long hatred for one another and their recent indirect and direct decimating of each other's home planes in a matter of hours during a war off screen. Absolute chef's kiss meme. Nahiri gets a bit of extra screen time acting shifty and looking over her shoulder in the Azorius Guild Hall when Jace gathers all the planeswalkers together, but that's about it. As such, it's pretty difficult to judge these cards on any standard set out by the story, although I will say that at least Nahiri is shown to use some kind of stone blade during the final battle at Bolas' Citadel. However, I do feel that both of these planeswalker cards having passed abilities that benefit other creatures or planeswalkers you control is kind of rich seeing as they spend the vast majority of the story solely focused on their battle with each other. Also, I have two major problems with Sorin's Thirst. One, it can't target Nahiri, so it doesn't make sense for her to be on the artwork being affected by the spell. And also, this scene never happens, not only because it's just not written into the book, but also because Bolas's statue gets torn down hours before Sorin even shows up on Ravnica, so there's no way that Sorin and Nahiri could have been fighting on Bolas's statue. And even if they did fight and then moved to the Azorius chamber and Sorin got lost and then they fought again, Again, you can see that there are planeswalker sparks in the sky and that definitely didn't happen until Domri got killed and the reason that he got killed was because he went to meet Bolas because he watched Vitugazi get destroyed after Vitugazi tore down Bolas's statue. God damn it Greg Weissman you make my job so hard! Angrath. Angrath actually does a surprising amount in this story, and as the UK's number one Angrath fan, I am super stoked to see my hot bull in action. Why did I write that line in? He spends every moment we see him in the story whirling his chains around his head, destroying Eternals and acting as a red hot AoE that other planeswalkers duck into to fight at a safe distance from the grip of Eternals. But not all of them though. Rest in power, human with shaved head and metal casting powers. He closes off his appearance in the novel with some pretty blunt but salient philosophy on why he doesn't pity the dead, more so those who the dead leave behind. Angrath is Keanu Reeves, confirmed. With his character considered, the majority of Angrath's representation on card form therefore is pretty incredibly on point flavour wise. Angrath's rampage perfectly showcases the whole chain whirling thing and his mass destruction ability. 
ability and his planeswalker's ability to give creatures you control menace perfectly represents his wide chain flailing which keeps him and other planeswalkers difficult to intercept by Eternals. His negative two, however, has absolutely no basis in the narrative whatsoever. Mark Rosewater tried to explain this on Blogatog as it representing how Angrath could wrangle Eternals to fight alongside him, but this is never showcased at any point in the novel. Jace is the only character to cause any kind of Eternal infighting, and even if Angrath had wrangled a crew of Eternals together to fight for him, surely this would have been better represented with some kind of threaten effect. Him having a mass is a super confusing decision, as if you're just getting your story solely from the cards, you wouldn't be mad in assuming that Angrath had sided with Bolas. Even his flavour text on a Han Crop Invader suggests that he's in awe of these Eternals and wants to create an army out of them, a sentiment that he never once expresses throughout the novel. Solid... Solid, like, B, I guess. B, high C. I've, I've not been ranking these. I'm not sure why I decided to do it now. Arlen. Whilst Arlen gets a wee bit more screen time than some of the other planeswalkers I've mentioned, she's only shown chatting with Angrath and at one time fighting in a berserker fury with Tooth and Claw against the Eternals. She doesn't summon any wolves or werewolves at any time, but as the flavour text of Ajani's pride mate implies, it's pretty safe to assume that all the planeswalkers are summoning creatures from their homeworlds, but just kind of, like, just out of shot. It does mean that neither of Arlen's cards have any kind of link to the story, and I do think that Wizards could have printed Arlen as an uncommon flip card in this set. They've done mechanical one-offs before when it was accurate to the flavour, and it's not like Arlen would be the only odd one-out card in War of the Spark. For example, Mowu is the only uncommon legendary creature, and Silent Submersible is the only submarine in existence with no evasion. Watley. Watley. One, whichever's the correct pronunciation. In the story, both Watley and Sahili turn up at the exact same time, and the former honestly doesn't do that much. Certainly nothing to do with either of her cards. Her Planeswalker card is more of a clarification of her Toughness Matters sub-theme rather than anything else, and her Raptor is, again, a representation of one of the creatures she can summon as a Planeswalker, but doesn't in the story. Jiang Yangu. There, I've said both of his names now. Now you can't be angry at me in the comments when I only say one of them. We don't see Jiang do any fighting, but we are shown Mowu growing and shrinking on demand as he jumps through the sewer to get out of the church. Jiang's Planeswalker card shows his ability to grow creatures, and Mowu's synergy showcases their bond with one another. Although Mowu not having a way to remove counters and thereby grow smaller for some kind of funky effect is a wee bit disappointing. Also, Jiang's passive isn't really explored at all in the story or in any other appearance that I'm aware of, but I'm sure we'll get round to finding out about him as the years go on. Vivian. This planeswalker has held Bolas as her nemesis since he destroyed her homeworld of Scala, and she even declares that she wants to kill the dragon herself when she first arrives on Ravnica. So it is somewhat odd that she never pushes to be the one to kill Bolas, or pulls a Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy and mucks up a plan to sate her own sense of vengeance. Regardless, I think that Vivian's planeswalker card is one of the greatest pieces of mechanics aping narrative in the whole of War of the Spark. Her negative two represents her notching an arrow ready to fire, and her plus one represents her sending out a spirit animal as an arrow which can hit flying targets, and her passive, which allows you to cast creatures at instant speed, allows her to fire off these creature spirit arrows at a suitably fast rate. This, this is the good stuff. I love people taking care and attention to detail in card design. This just mwah, Gorgeous, a actual legitimate chef's kiss here. Mwah! Her arc bow is another great representation of this action as well, and I love how when you tap it, it feels like you're one of those Olympic archers who are really bad at holding onto their bows. And her grizzly is also in this set. I thought that the big green V was going to die as another one of them surprise deaths, but I should have anticipated wizards only choosing to kill off the absolute bare minimum of characters. Uh, f bloody, f uh, rest, rest easy now, uh, Videlkin. I also predicted that Vivian's Arkbow would ultimately be useless against Bolas, and in a way I was right, because she never even tries to shoot him with it once. 
I guess all those artificers and nature mages on Scala spent their final days developing that super weapon for nothing. Good job honouring their memory, Vivian. Sarkin. Whilst we do see his hands turn into dragons like in the art on Sarkin's Catharsis, the battle against Bolas never actually goes to his meditation realm. I guess Sarkin just took out his years of frustration and the mental abuse he suffered at the hands of Bolas on a couple of Bolas's puddles before the book began for kicks. Sarkin's Planeswalker card doesn't reflect any of his actions throughout the story, although his negative three represents his inane ability as a Planeswalker to summon creatures, and we do know he can turn into a dragon so his plus one makes sense until you get to the bit where he turns other planeswalkers into dragons which is new personally i would have absolutely loved to have seen this in the book because i can imagine chandra and jaya having an absolutely wonderful time as dragons and angrath just getting super super pissed why am i covered in scales i can't see the wife like this the wanderer this Planeswalker's debut appearance manages to demonstrate this character's limits and abilities without giving anything away about her character or origin. She only turns up during the large battle scenes, but is shown to be an incredibly adept warrior fighting alongside Kane with her curved sword, which gives off kind of a glow as if it's made of some kind of energy that registers on a visual scale. Some kind of... Lightsaber. She has a pretty excellent moment when, during a melee, her powers have weakened to the point where her sword no longer glows and she asks Gideon to, quote, hit me as hard as you can. He does after a moment's hesitation and whilst the Wanderer's head snaps back an inch or two, the majority of that kinetic energy is transferred into her sword and she's back to full power. This is a new Black Panther style take on invulnerability in comparison to Gideon's more Superman style indestructibility and I enjoy seeing characters with great defensive abilities that have minor but potentially fatal weaknesses if exploited. There was that phenomenal part in the Battle for Zendikar story when Obnixilus almost drowned Gideon in a puddle, the water slipping right through his shield, and I'm excited to see what future battles the Wanderer finds herself in and how different writers work around her powers. Her ability to absorb physical damage damage is kind of represented in her passive which prevents non-combat damage, but doesn't fully capture what was shown in the novel. Maybe if she were to have some kind of Protean Hydra style passive, which would replace any loyalty counters lost to damage twice fold at the end of each turn, or a comeuppance style passive. Her negative two makes perfect sense seeing as she's portrayed as being an absolute menace on the battlefield, and her signature card, whilst being a tad dull, is still very on point in terms of flavour. Sahili. Sahili acts as the Lucius Fox to the Gatewatch's Justice League, fitting them out with Kaladeshian gadgets and gizmos that do everything from providing reconnaissance to blowing people up. Her ever-changing contraptions are wonderfully represented in her passive, which allows you to generate servos out of seemingly nowhere, and her negative too perfectly portrays her creation's ever-changing properties. Her silver wing, as well, represents just one of the ways that she uses her creations, and whilst Dovin's location isn't discerned from her creations, it's more just said by Jace, it's nice to see this little moment get its own card. Obnixilus. Speaking of characters who do a surprising amount of work in this story, Obnixilus is absolutely yucking it up on Ravnica. I talk more about Obnixilus's reasonably strange characterization in this novel in my livestream, but suffice to say that absolutely nothing he does pertains to any of his cards in this set. Whenever we see him in action in this story, he's usually using some kind of fire magic or growing bigger, and none of that has anything really to do with dealing damage when your opponent draws cards. I'm not entirely sure what that's mechanically supposed to represent, but even in the flavour text of his cruelty, we are presented with a completely different character to what we get in the book. Even at the moment when he goes through the planar gate and could just immediately planeswalk away, he doesn't. He actively helps by killing Eternals, and after they're dead, that's when he planeswalks away. And on top of all of this, the most egregious bit of missed flavour is that at no point in the novel do we ever see a pigeon get blown up. I'm feeling a zero. Samut. Whoa, slow down kiddos, Samut speed freaks here to save the day with velocity. This speed mage from Amonkhet- I'm not gonna keep doing that voice, it's really egregious. This speed mage from Amonkhet has a bone to pick with Nicol Bolas and demonstrates her wrath by killing off a bunch of Eternals she's known from Amonkhet. During the first fight we see her in, she kills the Eternalized Temet in a blink and you'll miss it moment along with a bunch of other named characters who don't appear on any cards, so you don't need to worry about that. At the beginning of chapter 45, she singles out a particular Eternal, which 
is revealed to be Neheb after she's killed him. Real champion of the Dreadhorde there. You get introduced and killed in the same line. Talk about speed! Samut's sprint perfectly conveys her speed magic and the scene of her running along the wall actually happens during the story. And the fact that her negative one effectively casts a copy of her sprint is a little bit of extra tasty flavor. Even if her passive makes a third of the abilities effect redundant unless you're in the mood for extra speed! Tezzeret. Oh, all right, home stretch now. Oh, Jesus! Let's build up to finally talking about Bolas by talking about Thing 1 and Thing- Oh, God, your body is so horrible! Tezzeret is on Amonkhet for the majority of the book before getting duped by a distraction led by Samut and Obnixilus, which allows Dak Faden to shoot one of Sahili's creations, a little bird that explodes, into Tezzeret's ch- Oh, shit, there is a bird that explodes in the novel. Oh, my bad. 10. With such a small appearance in the story, it's kind of difficult to judge how his abilities play with his presentation. None of them really have a root in the story, except for maybe his plus two, because he does try and attack the other planeswalkers he meets on Amonkhet. As garbage as it is that such a cool card is a buyer box exclusive, the fact that he exists outside of the set, much like he spends most of the story outside of the plane of Ravnica, is a subtle bit of meta flavour, I guess? As is the fact that his passive includes a keyword mechanic from outside of this set. Speaking of disappointments, Dovin Barn! Much like Tezzeret, Dovin acts as a mini-boss of sorts for the forces of the Gatewatch. He's just kind of hanging out in New Prath with his spy thopters, not really doing anything relevant to the narrative until his fight with good old lawful, neutral and chaotic good. Dovin's cards showcase his character pretty well, preventing damage and stopping devastating spells is pretty much in line with his character, although I find his planeswalker passive a bit milquetoast. Dovin's whole thing is that he could see the weakness in any of his enemies, and I feel like having a pithing needle star effect would give a lot more credence to his I studied all your moves angle as a planeswalker. Also, as bonus anti-flavour points, uh, there were no Azorius guild mages or enforcers anywhere in the battle. I guess they were too busy bird watching or not being able to see anything through their stupid hats. Bolus. Alright, we're there. Let's do it. Bolas honestly does so little in this story, I swear I thought I was missing chapters when I first read the book. It's never really clear what powers Bolas is gaining from the Elder Spell other than distant building demolition and the occasional caps lock. The passive on his Planeswalker card is never really explored at all within a narrative sense. We never see him use any additional powers that he didn't already have as a result of the Slain Walkers. Not that we'd actually know what those powers were because Bolas only kills people who we've never met, so... I don't know why I did that, that was weird wasn't it? His plus one just comes across as generically bolus as opposed to any character trait he's shown to have in the story. His negative three is at least a little bit more on flavour with his indirect actions throughout the narrative and his negative eight does perfectly sum up both his goal to be the only planeswalker on the field and also his failing that no matter how detailed his plans are he will never win if there are people willing to oppose him. I quite like that, that was a nice touch. I do feel like his minus three should have added loyalty counters though, as broken as that would have been, it seems a bit odd that this particular bolus grows weaker as he kills planeswalkers. And not just weaker in terms of loyalty counters, but also his passive becomes a lot less effective the fewer planeswalkers are on the field. Maybe his passive could have instead relied on planeswalkers in graveyards or in exile for a more accurate portrayal of whatever his powers were supposed to be in this story. His citadel as well doesn't really go any extra distance to explain his powers or play into the whole spark harvesting game plan. The Elder Spell, however, Ooh, we now this is pod racing. Overall, Bolas and his related cards are suitably epic in this set, but they don't really stand up to scrutiny when you compare them to his actual actions and character within the book. Last and slightly least, Ugin. Yet another character who only briefly turns up on Ravnica, shrouded by invisibility after he convinces Jace that Bolas needs to live in order to not turn up in three months time as yet another ghost. He knocks out his newly desparked brother and brings him through the blind eternities to his meditation realm, which he has redecorated. You may be thinking, heck, that's a radical fate for both Ugin and Bolas, but what the dick does it have to do with being able to cast colourless spells for cheaper? Well, 
Much like every other secondary character in this narrative, Ugin's card doesn't match up with the meagre actions we see him take in the story, although of course it does match up with our previous understanding of Ugin. The destroy target permanent bit is at least a little bit flavorful in that he can destroy Bolas, but an exile effect would have made a lot more sense given the whole like planar kidnapping context. Ugin's conjurant also never makes an appearance and uh, I, wait a minute. Is that? Oh, that's that's all of the all of the appropriate cards that I've talked about. Wow, I really ended that on a bummer. Um, no, no, well, let's end it somewhere different. I've been ripping into this novel a whole bunch, but the story that Wizards of the Coast told on the cards themselves of this set is leaps and bounds above anything I could have ever anticipated from War of the Spark. Even if a bunch of stuff was inconsistent with the original novel, I still loved the callbacks to fan favourite characters, the epic moments portrayed in fun little interactions, mechanics from Magic's past coming back in subtle ways, the uncommon planeswalkers, the exciting limited format. Wizards honestly knocked this set out of the park and ideally hope that this is the future of their storytelling rather than traditional media. I'd love to see the return of simple story articles and planeswalker guides for more specific lore, but I'd love to see the story conveyed on the cards much as it was in War of the Spark. Thank god this is going to be the last Magic the Gathering book we get in a hot while. I don't know if I could have... Wait, what's that sound? What's... what's going... Oh no. Oh no!